one thing that I, I knew that I had to do was eventually gain acceptance of what is. Because the idea is we have expectations that are here, reality is here. The difference between the two is suffering. And so I think being in, in LA, being an actor and being interested in studying my own psychology and human emotion and just learning the craft of acting, it invites you to want to do a lot of digging and to know where you're coming from and why you do the things you do. I think we're always refining our approach and our path and that requires uh, having to unlearn a lot of things. We're always just doing the best that we can. We're also human. The acceptance in there, the lesson that I hope to continue to learn more is just to be softer and more gentle with myself. I like that term you just used, softened, because that's a very judgment free. What has really shifted for you? I feel like I've always had a shovel. I've always had some kind of like pickaxe and I've always been digging and working and digging and working and yearning and going and digging and working. There's been this like angst behind it. And so I think the difference, I would say, it's like, oh, hey guy, you've been building this house for a long time. Don't you want to live in it? I want to live in all the work that I've done. Uh, the tools are still there, but they're not in my hand at all times. And that feels like the biggest difference, I would say, in my journey is it's this less of this anxious motivation because I feel like my motivation before was to fix or to solve or to heal or to grow. It almost blinded me in some ways. And let's pull back and take in the view. Welcome to the show, Travis Van Winkle. Thanks for having me. Dude, so um, just so people know, uh, Travis and I just met, and the way we got connected, uh, someone, Natasha, who does work for you, uh, heard a podcast that um, I did with her close friend, Steve Astafin, and she loved the episode and, and loved how... Uh, Steve showed up and in the different places we went into. And so she pinged me through Steve and said, listen, I think Travis Van Winkle would be great for your show. He's, he's on a similar journey to what I've been on. And, um, you know, so would you be interested? I was like, hell yeah. Like, let's do this. And at the time, my uh, son who actually just turned 19, but was you know 18 at the time. And my wife were fucking balls deep into watching you. And when your character came on, right? And and I didn't so know this. Both said, That's dad. Dude, exactly. <laughs> and my my assistant, who's also my niece, was like, I've been dying to tell you about this character. He's like you, but you know, I feel like you're in a little bit of a different place, but there have been parts of your journey that you're a lot like Carrie. So when I told them that um we were gonna Carrie, be doing yeah. a yes. <laughs> two peas in a pod that we were going to be doing a podcast. They're like, Oh my God, that's so perfect. So thanks for coming on. And, and I wanted to, as I share with you before we got on a few of the things that I would love to cover today, and I don't know if we're going to do it, but um, this is my intro that is not going to be pre-recorded, but this is the, the live time intro. I certainly want to get into your character of Carrie and how it relates to who Travis is and um, the similarities and the things you've learned maybe about, you know, really stepping into that character. I want to talk about biohacking because I know that is important to you, obviously within the character, but in your own life. So I think that'd be fun to explore just some of the things that we're both working with that have been helpful. Um, you know, and my podcast is The Great Unlearn. And so I'm really curious about your journey through Hollywood and what it was like when you got there and how you're really unlearning that process um, to who you are today. And then really like what's alive for you outside of acting? Like what are the things you're doing when you're not reading a script, preparing or, or on the set? So that along with, I know you do a, a ton of um, activist work and you've worked with build on for quite a long time. And so I'd love to tap into that as well. So those are some of the things that I would love for us to talk about. If we get to them, awesome. If we don't, it's still going to be a dope episode. So thanks for coming on. Um, I think what we'll probably end up talking about is just the playoff games last Sunday. They were nuts. Oh my God. We'll, we'll just talk about that the whole time. <laughs> and it was like from the weekend before, which was such a dud to what we experienced in 
Oh God, it was that, the wildest games I've ever seen. Ever, ever. Uh, but I'm just fucking around. I, I absolutely want to talk about everything you just said. And uh, thanks for the platform just to hang out and get to know you and to uh, to talk. Let's do it. Yeah. So um, before we get into, and I, I want to just give people and myself actually like a little context for how you ended up where you are today in Hollywood. Like, how did you get there? But before we get into that, I noticed earlier this week you had a bit of an incident with your dog and a couple of coyotes. And so just, just for a moment, can you explain what happened and, and how everything's going now? Cal, that was nuts. So I've been in LA now for 20 years. Um, I don't go to Griffith park all that often, but Griffith park, there's always some kind of coyotes, but usually they're these small little cute ones. You're like, Oh, look at that little thing. He's always got a loaf of bread. Like what a sweet little, sweet little buddy. That was not the case. The Sunday I went to, after the football games, I went to just go hang out. It was around 4 p.m. And there was probably, I don't know, 50 people just off to the left of me playing volleyball, hanging out with their dogs, having a picnic. Across the street was a, a kid's playground. I went off. I was kind of like 30 yards away from all of that in this little side area. So it's not like I'm far away from civilization, like in the middle of the woods. I'm next to everything. And I climb to the top of this hill and I throw these pieces of bark down the hill to my dog and she runs down the hill and then she looks back up to me and I throw another piece and I kind of throw it back and forth and she wears herself out. And it's so much fun. And we started doing that and she was kind of like halfway down the hill. I was at the top of the hill and I went to go throw this piece of bark and I noticed two coyotes come around this tree and they flanked her. One came low, one came high. And they didn't run directly at her, but they were moving towards her like that was their target. It was very clear that that was the game plan that they had. As soon as I saw them, uh, I screamed louder than I've ever screamed. And I barreled down that hill as fast as I possibly could. And the, the most economic way to do it was to slide. So I basically slid as far as I could while screaming. <laughs> and it was a race to see who could get to Karen first. Dude. And so it was wild because they got to her before I did it, the big one because the other one was waiting and I'm really glad she didn't run if she would have ran that would have been I wouldn't have been able to help oh yeah she's my dog my dog froze and so as the the coyote was approaching her at a pretty fast clip like she was moving or he or she whatever the coyote was I think it was a male because it's mating season they say that the males are extra aggressive right now and a lot of them have been pushed down because of the the fires in Northern California. Oh, okay. Um, so they're more aggressive at this moment. But as it was approaching Karen, I was about 10 yards away, still sliding, still making noise. And I was just loud enough and making such a scene that it did one snap at her and then bailed. And luckily that snap, it, it, didn't, it didn't impact her. There was no a uh, puncture wound. There was no wound at all. She kept licking the side of her leg afterwards. But for the most part, it was just a very big scare. The coyotes then ran off. Some people ran across the street and threw rocks at them to help me. I was more shaken up than my dog. I think my dog was, was like, why are you so well, I'm <laughs> yeah, Chill, uh, chill, dad. But I feel like I was faster than a Tesla. Like I, I ran probably 50 yards. Look at you. Seconds. All that training oh, for like your that. role. It worked. Right. <laughs> What I, th I think the observation that I like about this the most is no matter what, when your instincts are at play, you're not thinking about it. The, I'm, I wasn't thinking like, oh, if I scream really loud, are people going to think I'm weird? I wasn't thinking about anything other than saving my dog at all costs. And it was completely instinctual what happened. Like I like blacked out for 20 seconds, however long it took. And I think that there's such a, a power in being in the moment like that that I think only situations like this show you, uh, like give you an opportunity to like, we strive to be in the moment that deeply in our lives, which is why we meditate, which is why we do yoga, which is why we like, we're always trying to hone our mind and our focus, but we're so distracted. That was like a, a crash course in presence. That was just, it was wild. It could have gone the other way. And I'm really glad it went my way this time. And it was scary as all hell, man. Yeah, dude. And I love that. I love that, that, that idea that you take away from that, that this is what deep presence feels like. And, and unfortunately it's a, it's a situation that is, you know, the stakes are high, but it's a reminder. Like when we think we're in presence, we're maybe knocking on the door, but when we can drop in 
and our instincts, you know, take over, we get into that. I mean, arguably you're in some sort of a, a flow state immediately where nothing else matters except that. And you're not worried about the coyote coming and biting you. It's like, fuck all that. Like this is singular purpose. Now I got to ask, cause I'm sure some of the people listening are, how did you name your dog, Karen? So this, I named her before the whole Karen movement. <laughs> so this, this, this was before the whole Karen thing happened. So actually, that's another wild dog story. So three years ago, a little over three years ago, I had a dog named Nina that I named after my only living grandma. She's still alive today. My sister used to have a dog named Lucy named after my grandmother that had passed away. And my sister named her daughter Lucy after my grandmother. And so I had this thought when I got my last dog, Nina, well, my grandma probably feels she's probably wondering why no one's naming anyone after her. Uh So I named my dog Nina after my grandma. And then I introduced the two and it was such a special thing. Nina happened to get uh, hit by a car in New York um, Mm -hmm. three years ago. It was heartbreaking. She died in my arms. I let some kids play fetch with her in a park and she went out of the gate and just got hit by a car in uh, Williamsburg. Mm -hmm. It was like one second I've got my, my sweet little best friend. And then the next second, I don't know. And so there was a lot of trauma that came up with that. And some people that aren't dog people won't understand, but it's part of your family. Yeah. So it was a very, you know, traumatic thing that happened. And it took me a couple, a full year to really start processing it. And two months after Nina had passed away, my aunt had a crazy situation in how she passed away. My aunt has a big Labrador named Rocket. And they would always have a long leash attached to their house and they would go on their patio. They would attach rocket to the leash. They'd stand on their patio and they'd let their dog roam around the backyard, but never off leash. One day my aunt was out there and she's out there with rocket and rocket sees the neighbor dog and sprints towards them. The little metal clip that attaches to the dog's collar broke. And because rocket was running. So it's ironic. His name is rocket was running so fast that the leash recoiled and and swung back and hit my aunt in the middle of the forehead. And it was, it's it's like quick, it happens fast, you know, and um, she touched her head and it was kind of bleeding. Her neighbor came over and they kind of laughed it off. Like it was like, what the heck? Like that hurts. Let's go to the hospital. Let's get stitches, but no big deal. It's just like a bruise. So she got stitched up and pretty quickly after she went into convulsions, she went into a coma and she died in six days. What? So the doctors said that it was like a bullet wound. Her brain swelled in the same way that it would with a bullet wound. Her brain filled with blood. Um, and, and it was a pretty quick <sighs> exit. And she was 72, worked for the Postal Service, had an incredible family, has so many kids and grandkids, and just lived a beautiful life. And she always used to have this saying, when it's your time to go, it's your time to go. And funny enough, I mean, that was her saying. This could have hit a, like an inch to the left, an inch to the right, and she would have been fine, but because of where it hit her. So anyways, two months later, I'm at her funeral, and my dog had just passed away. She just passed away from a dog, a strange dog incident, and at her funeral, I decided if I get a new dog, I have to name the new dog Karen. Oh. And so then about two years later, when the pandemic happened, I started to think about getting a dog again, and and then this little you know ding dong popped into my life. and. Her name is Karen. So oh, it's kind of a long story. I love it. And I only, I usually, people will laugh when I say that, they say, what's your dog's name? And I'll say Karen. And they always get a good laugh out of it. And if I end up talking with them for a little while, or if they ask, I'll go into the elaborate story, get to share about my aunt, which is really a beautiful thing. And yeah. she's a wonderful human being. And um, But for the most part, people will just kind of laugh and giggle at the name. And I really don't get into it. So I'm glad I could share it with you. Yeah. And it's an, I mean, in, in frankly, even if it weren't, you know, in the Karen, if it was a Sharon or something, like it's, it's still kind of an odd name for a dog, but you did happen oh, yeah. to, you, know, you hit on something that was very apropos of the times as well. Uh, inadvertently. Um, I, I actually would love to talk just a minute about, um, about Nina and what, what that experience was like for you and how you, you know, were probably holding on to some of that trauma and what allowed you to move through it. Yeah, that was, um, that was such a shock. And I understand that, you know, there are, there's famine right now going on in Afghanistan. There are millions of people that are, are suffering and just the atrocities of being human. And I, 
I know people have lost their children, people lose their husbands, people lose their parents, and it's all very, very difficult. I know this is a dog. And I say that because some people, they, some people just might not understand that that can still cause trauma. It's still a death. I would um, say to that, so I would I, say that's, that's their work to do. Like, I'm with you. Like you have a, a deep connection. We have, we have some animal, we have some pets here. We have two dogs. We actually have a pig and we I just re- have a pig. really, the Viet- Vietnamese pot belly pig. We have a, she's a Juliana pig, which I don't know what the differences are, but she's about a hundred pounds. Her name is Petunia and she's coming up on four years old, but just an aside here, she, she was chasing the dogs. They were playing and something happened to her like hind leg and she was limping. I mean, and, and ultimately she ended up being fine. She had to be off it for a while, which is hard to tell a pig to be off. You know, I think just intuitively they know they're not going to move around a lot, but <laughs> dude, it broke my heart to watch her hobble around. I don't even know if she was in pain. Right. But I was projecting my own stuff onto her. So I get on some level the connection you can have with a non-human in your house. And if people don't understand that, then we don't need to explain ourselves to them. So speak so the freely. Explain that. The, the reason I explain that is because I had to go, th- that was part of my process in really accepting the situation and understanding my trauma because I had those thoughts come in that would sometimes make me go, you know what, this isn't as big of a deal as you think it is. And I had to deal with the fact, no, 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 this is a connection. This is a soul connection that was had. This is a traumatic situation. It seems like it's unfair in some way. And it happened all, very sudden. And I, I didn't hide away. I didn't shy away from the trauma or the pain. I actually went on this, this, um, my friend Andrew Horn runs this uh, men's this men's groups called Junto. Andrew, who lives in Austin now. Yeah. Yes, him I and, know Andrew. Uh, yeah, and his wife Mickey. Yeah, yeah. So he was. This was the. I think this was the third or fourth one of this Junto program that he was running, and I went on a men's retreat. That was part of it. Part of how I was dealing with that pain. I shared everything that was going on with with friends and new friends, and in a really safe space and. Uh, I, I mean, I, I cried a lot. I was very candid with the people I'm closest with. I have a lot of lovely friends and family that shared space for me to speak and allow myself to, to just let out whatever pain was coming out. Um, I feel like I faced it. I faced the darkness. I would go on like, um, ceremonial trips and like spread her ashes and Big Sur and some of the places that I would spend a lot of time with my dog. I would do a tremendous amount of journaling. I, I feel like through the process of this, I didn't want to bottle anything up. And, and it still took time uh, for me to, to process the, the pain of it and the loss. And, um, but, but I feel like the one thing that I, I knew that I had to do was Initial, uh, eventually gain acceptance of what is because the idea is we have expectations that are here reality is here the difference between the two is suffering and so let's say if my expectation well my dog should be alive mm. well, guess what your dog's not fucking alive guy so I, you can like hold on to what that is until eventually it bled down to reality but reality is my dog passed away in a very horrible freak accident was i part I had to deal partly with some of the guilt that I had because I'm the protector of my dog. So I didn't notice that the fence was open. Um, I shouldn't have let, I should have supervised the kids playing fetch with her. The kids were under 10. I didn't say, hey, kids, just so you know, this ball has to stay inside the park at all times. I didn't watch them. I kind of said, go play. And so there was some guilt that I had to also deal with of I didn't do my job in protecting her. And so that's connected to other guilt, you know, storage of guilt that I might have in my life from other things. So it brought up other um, angst that I may have had. And so the whole process was really, it just amplified, it just amplified my relationship with myself in some ways. And it was confronting as hell. And I did everything I could to truly face it. And the, the thing that does heal everything, and it's so cliche, is time. As the years go on, 
there's just a, it's just there's a softer it's just there's a softness and an understanding and like even i have stuff in my garage that i have her old bed i have her her old leash i have i have all these things that were hers and first year i was it's like i will never get rid of these second year i see them i'm like my new dog she'll use all this stuff third year they're just in my garage and i actually went down to the garage and I don't know if I need this stuff anymore. And so it just shows you how we really, as time goes on, the things that had such a grip on us, they they naturally loosen and soften with while, while the work is being done. And while we just That's naturally right. move on and create new relationships. And it was really confronting when I got a new dog. I was I compared her to the last dog. And this is not this is not dissimilar from people getting into new relationships with with humans. So I compared Nina to Karen. I was like, oh, Karen doesn't do this. And she's not this. And like, she doesn't like play fetch. And I had this, I had to realize, oh man, this is a totally new dog. This is a totally new friendship. What am I doing? But it took me some time to have to battle through that. So all in all, the lessons I learned through this, this, the, these, these two dogs has been instrumental, I believe in just my own understanding of life. And yeah long-winded story it's, no it's, it's it's kind of been it's kind of been a lot I, I love how you were able to you know really land for everyone that there are lessons in 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 all these experiences we have and, and someone could on the surface look like yes it's just a dog well when you dig deeper in in and we go into your experience with this and what you've learned and and i, I also love that you brought in this you know it's a very for me, it's a very Ram Dassian <clears throat> idea of, of how we create suffering, how we basically choose to go into our own suffering and expectation versus the reality of what's happening. And I know that, you know, just as I've been on my own journey, when, when I can reflect and maybe zoom out a little bit and understand that I have an expectation that has not been met and it's because it's, it's, not what the reality is. And, and it helps me kind of unlock that, that bit of tension that I'm holding. And when I can be totally aligned and just be an acceptance of things that are happening as they are, and I don't necessarily have to be happy that things have happened, but as you said, it's what happened. So what are you going to do about it now? So beautiful. Thank you for that, brother. Tell us. Also, I just want to let everyone know that's watching the video. I'm bringing turtlenecks back. I just wanted to let everyone know Turtlenecks are not forgotten. <laughs> Coming back big. They, they are classy and they will forever be part of my brand. So take it all in. Tell me this: what's what's the material? What what's the what's the blend you're working with? Are you sure? I mean, are you it's, sure? It's super cashmere, but I'm actually not sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Perfect. It's just it's just soft. It's just a soft vibe. Yeah. Anyways, you're about to ask me. Yeah. Tell us. Tell us. <laughs> you know. Tell us briefly, like how you ended up. You know, what did, what was the path for you to get to 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 the space of acting in Hollywood. I did not know that I was going to be an actor in my younger years. I wanted to be in the NFL. I was obsessed with football. I played since I was eight. I always wanted to be a wide receiver. I always wanted to I, I wanted to always play at an elite level. And I showed up, I put myself in a position to do that. I trained religiously. I was obsessed with it. I was in every football program you could imagine. I've played consistently for many years, I, I got to get, uh, I went to university of West Georgia and I got red shirted, um, my first year. And I feel like I was always at a little bit of a disadvantage because I graduated at 17. I was sure. a year younger than everyone in my class. So I had that, that year of a disadvantage of very important growing stage well nowadays you'd be two years you'd be two years behind because of the way kids especially here in 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 texas i mean they keep their kids back left and right so at least it was only one year you you imagine like a 19 year old versus a 17 year old or a 15 year old versus a 17 year old it's it's night and day when it comes to the development physically um and not only emotionally and and, and, uh, mentally um but physically i was always working against uh, like I was always the underdog. Anyways, I got redshirted and I played, uh, basically played for the for one season at this university and the game was just too big, too fast. And I wasn't able, 
I think if I, if I was committed to dedicating the next four years of workouts and, and, and like really putting in every bit of work when it came to my craft and the skill of football, I probably could have started my junior and senior year. But the thought of that, it just didn't, it didn't feel right to me anymore. And that dream needed to die so that a new one could, could be born. And as soon as I put that one to sleep, it was not an easy decision. No. But I, after I decided that dream that I'd had since I was eight years old was no more, it, uh, I actually started doing a little bit of, so flashback to high school, I had some friends that did modeling. Some of my mom's work friends were always telling me that I should do modeling and never really took the bait. Uh, but when I graduated high school, I had a friend that had done Abercrombie and Fitch. And I asked him, how did you do that? Because mm. uh, all the girls really liked him. He was on the bags and the billboards and the <laughs> yeah. surfboard, his shirt was off. And he just looked so cool. I was like, that, that looks like a, a nice opportunity. I want to do that. People say that I could do that. So why can't I do that? And so he hooked me up with his agent and I sent a picture of my pig in one hand <laughs> yes. and a football in the other hand. And I had my shirt off yes. and it was, um, my, our pig's name was Crazy Carl. Um, and they, and I, I, I called back in a couple of weeks and they said, well, you're the, the guy with the pig. Like, yeah, come in and let's, let's talk. And so after I stopped playing football, I started doing some modeling and I was t- a terrible model, but I was in, uh, Walmart, uh, nationwide. Hello. Hello. Let's go. I made it into this, um, department store called goodies. I did like just a bunch of small town stuff. I actually ended up doing Abercrombie and Fitch. There we go. In, in 2001, they, they, I went out to Savannah, Georgia. So I kind of got, I started getting into the model game and didn't really care too much about it. It was coinciding with my studies in school. I was studying business management and it's just being a, a fun university guy, hanging out with my friends and partying and learning that whole game. And, and it was just kind of a thing that I did. It, I still hadn't thought about acting yet. and. I eventually, I actually auditioned for this show called the Are You Hot Show, which mm. was a show about apparently uh, maybe good looking people that were going to go and test their hot skills. And Lorenzo Lamas was a judge, Rachel something, she used to be a supermodel. It was like a Rachel really Hunter? Stupid sh- Hunter, yes. It was not the best shows. This was when reality shows were first starting. It mm. was before the whole um, expansion of the, the reality show platform. Um, this was in 2002. And so I remember getting the audition for that. And my, my, my modeling agent said, Hey, would you be interested in trying out for the show? And they described to me what the show was and probably had a little vomit come up in my throat. So it sounds like <laughs> not I want to do. Yes. But I thought better of it. I was like, well, why not? So I borrowed my friend's leather jacket and I wore some really tight clothes. And I, it was actually the first time I did character work, um, but not the first time. I did character work because I remember when I was 16, my friends, my best friend's mom had me dress up like a, a girl, like a woman and go to my friend's birthday party. And I actually had him fooled for the whole party. He didn't know who I was. She, she, his mom just described me as a friend that was visiting in town. And then at the end of the, the mm. breakfast, or at the end of the dinner, I revealed it was me. And yes. everyone was like, what? So I'd always been cut Halloween and i have done a lot of character work when it came to Halloween being my favorite holiday. And my, I would always, cross-dressing for some reason for me has always been fun mm. um, um and any kind of dress up has been fun for me it's just any kind of getting lost in, into being some someone else physically um so anyways i put on a character for this show and i decided to be the most arrogant person alive and was talking about how i got girls like calling me all the time and like i'm just one of the coolest per- people on the planet and like my balls are huge i was just saying like the stupidest stuff just <laughs> to get noticed and they bought it and they actually put that on the damn show. No. Like, <laughs> terribly embarrassing. Dude. But it, they, they flew me out to Los Angeles and I visited Los Angeles at a soccer tournament with my sister years ago, but never actually like spent time there. There was a choreographer for the show that he basically was like, yo, you'd be good at acting. You should come out here and act. You'd be great. Think about it. I can help get you into extra work and I can tell you what classes to take and you should think about it. I didn't think anything of it. I flew home to finish university and this, this guy called me probably five or six times. And, um, eventually I decided I wanted to go spend the summer in Los Angeles. 
And I packed up my car and my dad and I drove to LA and my dad flew home and I spent the summer in LA and I jumped into an acting class my second day. I was an extra on, on Young and the Restless and Passions. I had transferred to Red Lobster. Um, <laughs> I was I, I was just like, I got injected into the system and I fell in love very quickly and knew that I was never going back to Georgia and that this was going to be my lifelong passion. I knew like that. Wow. And so I got introduced to this probably, there's probably many people that got introduced to acting in the same kind of journey. So it's not unique in any way. But for me, it was that I liked the observation that I had to close down one dream and this other one, this other one, it need, I needed, there needed to be that space for this new one to take shape. And sometimes when you have a failed dream, it doesn't mean that you're a failure. Sometimes that, that, that lived out, it's, it's time in my life. And naturally, organically, it came to a close and really embracing that and accepting that opened up a new path. And so it's like there, there's just something with endings and, and beginnings that I, I think have always been organic in my life that I always like, I always try to stay away. Of. And this was this was one of those things that it just opened up. It felt like it called me. I was in the right place at the right time. And it was a full body fuck yes. I love that. And that I think that's such an important principle too, is this this full body fuck yes. And so often I think we're drawn into a lot of maybes and sometimes no's because we're we're searching and we want something to happen and there's this an impatience to it. But you know, when, when you can settle into that and when you can, as you know, as you clearly tapping into your intuition, boom, go for it. There's also the other element, which I think not a lot of us recognize that there are these seasons of our journey and yours was playing football and having this level of football. And at a certain point, that's going to come to an end. And um, sometimes it's very kind of organically and sometimes it's very abruptly. But like, if we can just be in, as you said, be an acceptance of that, it allows a whole new world to open up to you because now you're no longer holding on to that dream. And look, like, look at what you are 20 years later on this amazing hit show, which I want to talk about Carrie. I want you for, for the people who haven't watched the show yet and you have to watch it's so good. Uh, Give them an idea of who Carrie is. So if you haven't watched the show, please go watch it. It's a really great season. I'm really proud of proud of my work, but just proud in general of the of just the season. It's just a really compelling story and show. And it's really twisted because you're rooting for someone that's doing terrible things. And he wants to do better in his life. And he wants to refine his character and and like just be a better human, but he just really sucks at it. <laughs> and it's rather funny. Uh, the show is just, it's, it's great. Um, Carrie, Carrie Conrad, he is a larger than life kind of guy. Mm -hmm. He's hell bent on optimization. He wants to optimize every cell in his body. He wants to optimize every cell in your body. Mm -hmm. And he'll go to great lengths to make sure that happens. And I think Carrie also is just an optimist and wants to do good for the world. And he's also, uh, successful and passionate and readily shares his opinions. And I don't think cares a lot about what other people think. <laughs> and so there is a lot of freedom that this character to play, playing a character like that. There's just, there's, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of space to just go in any direction. Like there's no wrong. There's no wrong way with Carrie. Dude, it's like, this is hitting so on the nose for me. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and anybody who knows me and hears that description is like, yeah, dude. Did I just describe you? I fucking think you did. I've been a little more integrated lately than maybe I was before, but I was way more like Carrie than I thought after that description. Cause I, you know, I've seen the show and I've seen your character and I'm like, yeah, that resonates. Like I get it. And then it's like, you basically just described me. But what I love, and we talked about this before we got on, you're like, he has a good heart. He, it's like his intentions are pure. And I want to add that for the people listening as well. Yes. Because and there is I some... Before was that his, his, his intentions are pure. And that is, as an actor, playing someone, playing a character where, whose intentions are really pure and he wants to do so... He wants to do... He only wants to do good. There's, there is... Um, 
that's such a universal theme. That's something universal that we all have inside of us. And so the reservoirs to tap into that are very deep and real. And so to, to know that that's how you live your life, like you have integrity, like, mm-hmm. of, of course, like we all have our version of that. I think Carrie's was just on like 10 lines of cocaine and like it, he was the amplified version of that. Yes. So th- that's who Carrie was. Carrie is all the things that, that you are, but times a hundred. And yeah. that's what kind of makes it, that's what makes it kind of funny as well. Is yeah. You're seeing this blown out version in some way. Totally. And, and, and the, the writers nailed it a, because they're, they're able to bring out this, this, like this coexistence of the, the toxic masculinity and the divine masculinity. And to show that, you know what, we're all versions of both of those things. And there are times when we tip into one more than the other. And so there's so much truth in, you know, I'm just reflecting back on episode five into the woods. And I think there's so much, there's so much richness in that. And some of it made me cringe because I've been on those retreats. I've done all that stuff. And there's some real beauty in that, but there's also some stuff that's like, oh, we didn't quite get that right. But, you know, it's, it's really that episode in particular is just really rich with, with men's work and what it looks like and how even with the best of intentions, maybe it doesn't play out like you would love it to, but in the end, what happens? I know it's a little spoiler alert here, but you get to the darkness within and you're accepted and there's this like, Oh, you know what? That's beautiful. Cause that's what we're all going for. At least in, in those spaces. I know when I've been there, like it is about feeling accepted, feeling part of the brotherhood, the tribe, whatever you want to call it and having your shit out there for everyone to see and still loving you and accepting you. Right. And that's, and then I especially love where there's all the crying, right. Cause this, it's such a part of it. And Um, just that having that release and being okay with it. I mean, you and I both know that we've grown up in a, in a culture where that's not necessarily accepted. I think today it's, it's on the rise and it is more accepted. And I think that's beautiful because we get to actually process these, um, experiences of our younger, our younger selves and the traumas we have, and we get to bring it out there without feeling like we're going to be judged to feeling like someone or a group of people are going to be able to hold that space for us to work through that process. Cause we can't really can't do it by ourselves. We can't, we need to be seen and heard by others. And so I love, yeah. I really love the, the, I love the, the, your character in the show and what he brings to something is very uh, relevant to the work that a lot of men and women, but you know, in this particular men are doing. Oh, I love that. I love that you have such a strong connection to the writing of the show. It's a, I think it's a testament to, to just the showrunners and to the storytelling of the, of, of the creatives behind the show, because mm. they're the ones that have tapped in. I just got to, to really build something off of their words. But I think, you know, traditionally men have suffered in silence. And what I think is so beautiful about that particular episode is like you were saying, there is an acceptance, even though there was some reluctance to to want to you know to really give himself. Pen, uh, Joe didn't want to fully give himself over. Mm-hmm. Through the, we all have resistance when it comes to situations of sharing because we've been so conditioned to hold it all in. And so, like even the process of sometimes sharing our darkest stuff, you're like, uh, I don't know. And then you do, and there is a release. That's one of the releases. And then the second release is actually feeling like you're accepted. Like that wasn't so bad. Oh yeah, I got that. I understand that. You then start hearing that other men have experienced that. And then there's this idea that we are not so different, but if you were to let go of that information, you have these stories you tell yourself that keep you in the box. And so I think instead of suffering silently and um, kind of uh, white knuckling it, Mm -hmm. it, as ridiculous as the show may be, it definitely is providing a platform to say, you know, share your stuff, find a group of men and, 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 you know, celebrate all of the, the shit that's happened in your life. That's good and bad because it's, it's every, everyone's going through it. We all got it. And just 
just accept it. And um, I think it's the this, this show has a lot of there's there's a lot of depth to the show. As silly as it is, there's a lot of depth, and that's what drew me to the character. Yeah, and I and I, I just really hope when people watch, they don't get lost in the absurdity of it because there is there's there's some there is some great writing in there, and you know you really. <laughs> you know, not to butter your nuts here too much, but you nailed it. Like you, you, you embodied, you know, my experience of whether it's myself or others that I've seen in that space of what it means to show up in integrity in that role as that character. And so how much, I love that. Thank you for that. Yeah, well, how much, like how much, uh, no, exp- my, ball, my balls are buttered. There we go. <laughs> Consider them buttered. How how much experience have you had with 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 men's work, with being in groups? I know you mentioned um, Andrew uh, Andrew Horn, but like, have you done a lot of that? Did you do some more in prep for the role? Like, what is what has been your experience? Well, I think moving to LA after growing up in Georgia was at first a culture shock to me because it's just it's so diverse out here and. Every walk of life is is here, and um, I think it, there are so many more opportunities for progressive thought um, in California. And, and I know Georgia's changing, and you know Atlanta's become this really cool, uh, uh, like liberal kind of city. Um, but I don't think it was always that growing up there. And so I think being in, in LA and being an actor and being interested in, in studying my own psychology and just the human emotion and just learning the craft of acting, it invites you to want to do a lot of digging and it invites you to want to carve out that space to know yourself and to know where you're coming from and why you do the things you do. So I think I've, I've always had some form of curiosity around that and Mm. naturally choosing this profession, this profession choosing me, it just, it just carved a much deeper uh, desire and yearning for, for that. So I think, I've always been someone that I started therapy at 27 years old and holy shit that I need it. What brought you into therapy? It. Yeah, it was a relationship that had failed and I just felt so much angst and I was not happy in my life. I just felt riddled with my own contradicting thoughts and, and actions. And I was just drawn to want to find a way to uh, untangle all of, all of this. And, and I'm glad that I did. And, you know, so that was one platform that I've just over the years have, have just been in different therapy techniques and processes. I've done different retreats. Um, I've tried psilocybin mushrooms and I've done different, a couple different ayahuasca experiences with the safe group. And um, I think also there is, there is a lot of, it's not the same kind of like men's retreat, but I've done a lot of um, service work and those are soul retreats in a way where the more you focus on, on other people and doing it for other people, the more you somehow learn about yourself. Um, so I just feel like I also live a very adventurous lifestyle, uh, which is another form of like soul retreat because nature is one of our greatest teachers for sure. Yeah. So, I, what is, what is I it, what does that look like? Adventurous lifestyle. There have been times in my, uh, well, first of all, like I'll, I love to go jump in the ocean, regardless of how cold it is. I want to go climb whatever tallest mountain there is. I want to go, I want to go camp and get punched by the stars in some area where there's not a lot of electricity. I want to, um, I, I just, I'll go anywhere and barrel down a mountain on some skis or on a snowboard. Give me a four wheeler. Let's go have some fun. Let's go fishing. Let's, let's do whatever it is. Let's just go. Let's go, to, or even just traveling to a different country. Let's go rent bicycles and get to know where we're at. Let's go rent a car in in um, Scotland and go drive around. Let's whatever adventures. I just want to go explore and learn new things and learn, meet new people and l- learn about cultures outside of my own and just um, live just live my life. You know? Dude, everybody listening is like, I want to fucking hang out with Travis. He sounds like fun, <laughs> but that's dope. Like, yes, like go play. Like you're fucking living the game of life and having different experiences and and finding out what's working for you and what's not. And for me, that's been the thing. Like what, what is it? You know, I think that's maybe why I connect a little bit to Carrie. It's like, he's just like fucking game on. Like I'm ready to do anything because it's going to enrich my life. I love that. Is that Karen? 
I mean, that's it is. Hey, uh, hey, Karen. Hey, uh, hey, Karen. Look, Karen. Look, come here, come here. Look. Oh, what's this? Tricked you? Yeah, this is Karen. Hello. Did you beat up two coyotes the other day. <laughs> you did, what's, badass. What's so, what's so funny is when I, I finally picked her up. Coyotes kind of uh, teetered off. They circled back around at the top of the mountain where I was standing. I got some video, and as soon as Karen actually saw them, she looked at him and goes, Arr. Arr. like she was like, I'll get you. It's like, <laughs> okay, now you, there you go. Yes. You have no chance, Karen. <laughs> I love your chutzpah. <laughs> um, anyway, so just to tie that back in, I think that there's been, I think that Carrie, I'm not that different from Carrie. I mean, there's many differences. But the parts of me that are carry, I just got to really amplify. And so it was, you know, I've been to like a David Data retreat with a group. Oh, of, hell yeah. I love David. David Data's and, Way of Superior Man is, is one of my top three books. It was a really cool retreat. And, you know, sometimes in, in the work, you don't plan to use some of your personal life. But in the moment when things have a similar resonance, some memories may come up. And there was there was a moment that got cut out of the that woods into the woods episode, where after I punch Penn in the face, and I'm telling him to punch me, he does, and then I tell him I'd say I tell him to scream, and I scream, then he screams, and in the moment that he's screaming, I remember I, rem- I flash back to the David Data seminar, and we were supposed to stand in front of our woman and let the feminine fully express itself, and our masculine was to stand there and just hold space, no reaction, just to hold space. And the fury of whatever came out from that feminine release was not meant to scare us, push us back. We were just to really embrace like being that, that, that oak tree. And so we had that kind of experience with the David Data Seminar. And, and in the moment of filming the scene, I, I had that thought of, oh, I've done this before. Mm. And I was just the oak tree for Joe in the show. And they didn't use it. Um, but I say that because when you act, sometimes your own personal experiences come in to open up an empathetic, uh, like the door of empathy. So you can really understand your character. That was one of those moments that was a surprise on set in the moment. That's so cool. Yeah, man. That's it, right? That's I, And I'm guessing that those... Those are the things that really, again, as you said, really drew you to that character. Um, and you had to be so stoked. And I know, again, um, in, in just prepping for today, like I know that you were actually at a crossroads when this opportunity came up because you've been working on a pilot that was, uh, I believe was picked up and it was going to conflict with with you. So like, what was it? Was it just the, the, the character of Carrie and, there was such a deep resonance and you were going to have fun with it. Was that like the, like what was the tipping point for you to decide um, to go with you versus the other option? The other option was was such a great moment in my life when all that came together and the, the talent of actors that are on that show and the showrunners and even the the studio behind it was, was all someone that I connect so deeply with that I built very deep relationships with. And so getting that show was a huge moment in my life. And it was, it was a hard decision to end up choosing you, but you, the character on you, the storytelling, it, it, this character just gripped me. Mm. I had such a deep connection to this character and, and the, 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 the reach of you and on Netflix, the show was already wildly successful and that that platform was also enticing but i would say i chose doing this show because the character really spoke to me and you don't get to do a lot of stuff like that on network television and it was just like this when i was pitched i was pitched the whole season so i knew what my character was going to go through and just the the idea of being able to embody a journey like that Ugh. was something that i like i can't pass up on this opportunity even though it 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 was a really hard decision and I, 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 you know, shed tears over that decision and, and had to like, there's a family that's being created on that show right now and they're wow. filming their season. And it's like, like a whole, it's a thing. And I look at their photos and I'm like, Oh, I could have been a part of it. That could have been me. Yeah. And I crave that sure. also. 
So like it, everything, we make decisions that cost us something. And that, that was, even though I made the, the decision that I feel was, was the one that was the right one for me, it still cost me something. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. And then, you know, I, I can't help but reflect on, you know, you getting to look at what the whole, the whole season looks like and it, and it's correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I'm wondering if it's, if it's been a bit of a kind of season long plant medicine journey for you to go through that characters, you know, on screen through his development, but also like got to be taking stuff from that. Like the, the line has to be so blurred as an actor. I can't imagine what that's like when it's so close in some ways to the journey you're on. And then like, what has that been like for you? Like think about before you started filming the first episode to today, like what, what do you think like the biggest change has been for you or how has it supported you in your own kind of awakening? I think Carrie taught me that I'm, I'm really good at life and I'll, and, and I don't say that in, in a way that's, that's being arrogant. Um, I say that with all the humility possible that, but he taught me that I feel like when I got this role, I hired a nutritionist and a trainer. I had a desire for my body to look a certain way so that I could really embody what I felt like Carrie looked like. Also, choosing to have a very regimented approach to my my body physically was building my mind mentally because it takes it takes a certain amount of dedication and, and, and focus um, and resilience and effort to keep showing up for yourself in that way. And so I put on 10 pounds of muscle in two months and I completely changed my nutrition and my diet. And I, um, I dedicated myself to this, like I was an Olympic athlete and mm. I started reading a lot of sports psychology. Um, so John Marklin's my acting coach and he recommended some books to read. And so I was not only really learning that if I put my mind to something, I can absolutely succeed and exceed my expectations. So like it was teaching me that I'm good at, I'm good at my, I'm good at life. I, I want something, I go after it, I find the plan and I, I achieve it. So I feel like there was, there was a cool, um, just synergy that was happening with my preparation for Carrie that was also inspiring me and teaching me about myself. Um, and so all in all, I don't know, I feel like there's just, there's always, you learn no matter what, you just learn from any experience you're in. If you've got that kind of mindset, you're always going to learn something. And I feel like I, this, this being on this show, the whole ride of the show, showing up for the show. And there also, there was a lot of um, serendipitous happenings that happened during the filming. And so also trusting that there's like this auspicious quality to life that I know for me, I feel like, I just, I just feel like there's, there's a synchronicity that happens in my life that I'm always looking for that I know there's times when like this charge comes up and I go, Oh, pay attention right now. Something, there needs to be some, something like really synchronistic is about to happen. And then usually when that bubble comes up, yeah. something, something happens. And then a lot of times I look back and connect the dots in my life in some ways. And I'm like, Oh wow, that makes a tremendous amount of sense why that happened. And so I'm, I'm, I've learned, I think this character was asking me to learn to, to trust more of that process uh, in not only the character, but in myself. Yeah. So all, there's a lot, a lot of lessons, I think, from, from playing Carrie. That's great. And I love, you know, that I hear, hear you talking about serendipity and, and, and synchronicity. It's because you do have that mindset, as you, as you mentioned, and that you are good at life and that you're open, you're open to whatever's meant to happen. There's again, being in that state of acceptance, I think is a huge, like, just want, I don't want people to miss what you're saying because these things don't just happen because you got lucky. It happened because you've said yes and you're open and you're, you're doing your bet, the best you can to mitigate that, that bit of suffering that we all want to drop into. Right. And so just to like be present with, with what's happening, I think has created all these opportunities for you and life becomes pretty easy because you're following, it sounds like to me, the fuck yeses. And the more you do that, you, you start to 
push away and say no to the maybes. And then you're just, you're in this kind of vortex of like, holy shit, I get to live this life. Very cool, man. That, like that's, that's, that's the goal, you know? And I think we all, it's the human condition to fall short. It's the human condition to, we're patterned. So sometimes, you know, we compromise ourselves in some way and then we learn from that and then we, we learn to not do so. And I think we're always refining our approach and our path. And that requires uh, having to unlearn a lot of things. There we and go. A lot of times, like having a lot of times, you know, we, we, we're always just doing the best that we can. And so, yes, the goal is exactly what you're talking about. But sometimes, sometimes I fall very short of that. And sometimes I'm stuck in patterns that I know I want to break, but I have trouble breaking. And so it's like, we're also human. And I think the, the lesson that I'm, the acceptance in there, the lesson that I hope to continue to learn more is just to be softer and more gentle with myself when I'm not necessarily uh, acting and taking action in the way that I know that I want to. Yeah. It's, it's so it's, hard to find the process. words for it, right? Because you're like, it's a fucking when I'm process. not, yeah. when you're, you almost want to say like when I'm not at my best, but you're like, fuck, I'm actually always at my best. It's just not the best that I'm the most proud of. And that's like the, it's like the that's, trick. That's a great point. Yeah. And I, and I, I feel the same way. Like in all moments, we're doing the best we can. Sometimes we just don't have much in the well to, to show up in a way that feels great, but that's what we've got. So it's, it's, it's really, it's a challenge and it's to be able to accept all versions of yourself through that is, I think has been one of my kind of greatest lessons, like, bro, all that, you know, you look back in those moments when you weren't you know, really proud of what you were doing, that's still you, you still, <laughs> right? And the more like I would try to push that away, it's like, oh, that's the old version of me. It's like, bro, it's still you. And it's like owning that and not having the shame around whatever that is. We all have that stuff in our past that maybe we're not necessarily proud of, but that's the learning, right? Like, oh, I don't want to do that again because that's, that's how it affected people or affected my life and kind of so on and so forth. I'm curious, what opportunities have come about? Because I know you've obviously done work for a while there, right? You've been in Hollywood for 20 years, right? You've, you've been doing work but you're on a huge show. You play a really interesting character. Um, who, by the way, I mean, talk about bringing in all the things. I mean, you and your, your, you know, wife are into polyamory and it's like in Austin, you know, since we've been here, it seems like it's been a pretty hot topic and there've been many people who have explored it for the record. My wife and I have not no judgment against anybody who has some of my closest friends, have been deep in it. They've left it. They're into monogamy now and, and all that, but it's so interesting to watch that journey and to, to in some ways, uh, well, definitely on the outside looking in, but being able to actually feel the struggle and the pain and the joy. And like <laughs> when Joe says compersion, I'm like, how many fucking times have I heard the word compersion? And the first time I ever heard it was in relation to polyamory. So it was fascinating to me. So anyway. Yeah, those writers, man. They, oh, they're they so amazing. good. But yeah, tell me, um, what's, oh. what's it look like since, um, since the season's been released? So like, there's a new show on HBO Max called Made for Love, which is a really dark, it's a dark comedy. Uh, I'll be in the end of their season two. So, and then if they get another season, I'll, I'll come through and probably be the main villain. Oh. Um, so opportunity wise, that's, that's the thing that, that, that I have coming up next. I think the exposure of this, a lot of great press had, it's come from you. And I, I don't think I've ever been on a show where I've had so much interest um, and so much to talk about, but I think, I think it's still yet to be determined the impact that this show has had on my career. Yeah. You know, oh, think, for uh, sure. I think this. I think the sky's the limit, and we're in a we're in a phase right now in Los Angeles where a lot of auditions are coming through currently, and it's called pilot season. It's when shows are casting for their whether new shows or existing shows. And so I think I think I will find out soon what the impact is really bad. Because I mean, the show pretty much has only been out for a month or two, for two months really, but. 
I'm excited to see what the impact is. And I think what I can take away is that I learned a lot and I got a lot. And um, I've grown a lot as an actor and as a person. And, and so it served its purpose in that way. And what's to come is, is still unknown. And I guess yeah. that's the exciting part. Yeah. Yeah. You've got some great tape to show for, for uh, any upcoming roles for sure. It's so fun. And it, you know what? I, it's funny. The, the thing I just thought about is I, uh, a few years ago, I met Danny McBride at a kind of an event. I'm a huge, like Kenny Powers. Right. Gemstones. Right, right. I mean, he, he's so good. And what, what, the, what I'm taking away from that is he's a version to me, he was a version of Kenny Powers, but he was like all the good shit about Kenny Powers. It was like, he was funny and, you know, so I almost see like people seeing you as Carrie and then meeting you and getting to know you. It's like, he's a bit like Carrie, but like the, 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 all the integrated stuff, the stuff that's, you know, again, back to buttering your, your nuts here. But like, I feel <laughs> that that's, that's kind of some nice tape for you to, to, to play with anyway. Uh, Let's well, talk about biohacking. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Let, okay. Let's let's talk a little bit about um, some of the practices that 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 you employ on a daily or a regular basis that really help you, you know, really optimize. I mean, let's talk about just again, like Carrie, like where, you know, I used to be much more in the try to optimize everything, and now it's like, what do I need right now to feel at my best? You know, so whether it's a sauna cold plunge, meditation and, and the like, like what are, what are some of the practices that you really enjoy? I mean, one of the things that I've been doing now is I only eat when I'm hungry. Oof. So I think before I used to have some unhealthy eating habits where I would eat if I was emotional or uncomfortable or ang anxious. Now I feel like I eat when I'm hungry and I listen to my body. So that feels optimal to me. Yeah. Um, I don't have any baggage around eating sweets or overeating or uh, really anything around eating. So th I feel like I've become more optimal in my thought around food. Um, and it wasn't always the case. In my late 20s and early 30s, I, I had a lot of guilt and shame around some of my eating habits. And I didn't fully trust myself around my nutrition and I feel like I've just learned a lot about essential um, omega threes, how essential they are. That's another thing that I have daily. Mm -hmm. um, I think what I've been really embodying recently is I have two songs that I'll play and I'll just dance in the morning and just wake my body up, but also songs that make me feel really good. No shit. And so it's just like this thing. I'll just kind of move around and just be like, Fuck, oh, I fucking like, love this. What, what, so what, what are the songs? Well, give me an idea of the vibe that the songs are. Uh, what is the song? I heard this song the other day and I, this has been my song for like the last four days. Um, <laughs> yeah. and it'll change, it'll change. See, if it were me, I probably wouldn't and change. Be, my wife would just, she, she can't stand that I listen to the same shit all the time. Look, I just get it a vibe with something and I might listen to <laughs> one artist for a month, but. Anyway, so what do we got here? This one's called, it's from One Republic, and it's called Good Life. If I'm in a down mood or if I'm feeling like a little sluggish or if uh, I just want to change my state, yeah. I'll put on a good song and I'll just move my body, not care what it looks like, and just kind of get to my own flow. Another thing is cold, 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 cold water on my face. Something every morning I'll wake up and I would just like to the point where my face is tingling because it's so cold. Yeah. Um, I just like, I like do it. It feels like that just wakes up every cell in my body. Um, my, my meditation practice has been something that I'm reintegrating. I've during filming, I, I meditate twice a day and I'm like really in a pocket, but since then my, 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 my workouts and my nutrition and my meditation, if it's kind of softened a little bit, so I'm reintegrating into my meditation game. I, li I like that, that term you just used softened what? because that's a very judgment free, It'd be easy for you to beat yourself up because you're not as disciplined as you were before, but you know what, these things have just softened and it allows you to experience them in a new way. 
in an, a kind of like exploring, like, okay, how do I need these practices now? And I, again, I think so many of us, uh, and again, I yeah. used to be like this, but I'm much more accepting of, well, you know, this is what I need right now. And my breathwork practice has fallen off or whatever. It's like, it's okay. Like I'm okay. What am I called to do? You know, and meditation, I think can be one of those things yeah. in particular. I've been through many variations and stages. You know, this isn't the first time that I've been so in love with a practice and then it eventually falls off and, and, and then it comes back as something new. This has been many iterations of this over the course of, I don't know, 12, 13 years. And so I think as you keep, as it keeps happening, you find, oh, this is the process of it. This is just kind of the, the ebb and flow and the evolution of it. And so there is a, a greater embracing and less, less uh, punishment around like, oh, I, I missed it today. Oh, I need to. It's less of that and more of, oh, I can feel like my body's really calling for this again. And that's presence, that's right? Versus the old version of, oh, I need to do this. Da, da, da. And it's like everything's just done because you're supposed to do it. And you're setting it up. And for me, it just loses that connection to the practice. And I also just feel like, a much shorter version of the season, you know, we, we spoke about with football and when you let that go, right. And you moved into, to modeling and acting, we go through these seasons with these different practices and can we just allow for it to be just that maybe it's a one month season, maybe it's a three month, but there is an ebb and flow. And when we tune into what we really need, sure. We need structure around it, but we need just enough structure so we can play with these different modalities and experiences and then be present with them. Because when there's so much structure for me, I just lose presence. I'm just doing it because that's what I said I was going to do. And I'm disciplined and, you know, rigid. so rigid. Yeah. And that was the term my wife used to use with me quite often. You're just so damn rigid. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, and guess what? You probably still are in some ways, and I know that I probably said I'm in my in some ways too. And like that's that's part of the work. I used to get mad when at myself that I would have to like. It's almost like you have to, you know, you have to put oil in your car. Sometimes you have to clean your car. So you, sometimes it's the same thing with your mind. Sometimes our mind just wants to, it'll like just get sucked down into itself, and you get stuck in these patterns. And it's our job to build it back up to redirect it. It's our job to lift it back up, start focus on what it wants to put. It's like, it's always, it's, it's somewhat the job. And yeah. I think there was a moment when I got mad that my mind just didn't naturally work optimally. <laughs> yeah. like, After all this work. Fire. Yes. I mean, you look at, you look at a fire and you start a fire, you put a bunch of logs on there, you, you're lighting a fire and you can enjoy it. If you don't adjust the logs, the fire won't continue to burn at its most optimal place. And, and so like, if you get mad at the fire, oh, why are you burning fire? Yes. That's the most asinine thing yes. ever. Our mind is exactly the same. Sometimes you have to add a new log. Sometimes you have to adjust the logs to make sure that they're stacked in a certain way. You can enjoy the process, and sometimes when they're in the perfect position, you can sit there and just take it all in and enjoy the the ferocity of that fire. It's perfect. It's beautiful. And then eventually, you're gonna have to adjust the logs again and add a new log. And sometimes you got to put the fire out, yeah. you know. And so it's like it's the same thing as in our minds. And I think um, yeah, I like that analogy of like tending the fire because there are different elements. The wind's coming in, or now there's no wind and it's going out, so you got to blow on it. You got to add a little some kindling. Like there's there's like this element of self care that if we're present with it, if we're, we have our attention on that, we get to see the signals and we, you know, we're, we're conscious of what's going on. And, and again, it's by design, I think we're conditioned to be very structured and follow the rules and, and th 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 this is what you do. This is, you should and shouldn't. And it's real easy to get stuck in that kind of old paradigm. And I think that's part of the, the beauty. And for me, like the, the whole unlearning is stepping away from these old structures, seeing what's useful within them. But like, how do we get to play? How do we get to be creative with a little bit of structure in that? And, you know, these practices, these 
you know, biohacking principles, they're the same. I mean, you do need to have some structure so you understand the practice, meditation, whatever, breath work. But once you have enough kind of skill or aptitude around it, then it's time to just play and see what the body wants. You know, I have a couple, a couple of tips for anybody listening out there for meditation. Um, some things I've been listening to lately, because I generally like to listen to some sort of music or a guided meditation. And a, a friend of mine, Justin Beretta, has done a couple um, collaborations. He did two with Ram Dass and he did one with Alan Watts. Ooh. And they're, okay. <laughs> they're amazing. Yeah. So Beretta, B-O-R-E-T-A, find it on Spotify or I'm sure on Apple Music, but just look at his Ram Dass and uh, Alan Watts. Their lectures where he puts ambient music behind it. It's, it's incredible. I also love basically anything East Forest has done is really awesome to listen to. Um, oh, when I'm, Forest. oh, brother. You are going to love East Forest so much. And then I've been, for the past probably six or seven months, I've been using a nose spray called Meditation Mist from MitoZen. And we'll link to all this in the show notes, but MitoZen, M-I-T-O-Z-E-N. He's got three different nose sprays. One's an extra strength. One's an EO, which is essential oil. And then one's a CBD. I love this stuff. And in the morning, I'll, you know, I've worked up to the extra strength. I recommend people start with either the EO or the the CBD, but just a couple sprays and then just do some nice, easy breathing. And it just drops me in. Have you done Hape before? No. Oh, so Hape is um, sacred. I know that to... they've included that in, in some of the ayahuasca experiences. Yes. And that's why I wondered if maybe you had had it during your ayahuasca experience. So a lot of times they'll do it prior to ceremony to clear the energy. And, um, hape is a sacred Amazonian tobacco snuff that you, that you blow up your nose. And, um, it, it certainly clears the energy for me. It gets me out of my head and into my body and literally you feel the energy move through your body. So it's a really cool, um, kind of tool I'll put a link to all this. I want to, I want to know about all this. Put I'll, set, so I'll set you up brother for sure. For sure. <laughs> um, but there's a little bit of hoppe in each of these nose sprays. The extra strength has the most hoppe. That's why it's extra strength. But again, it gets you out of your head and into your body and allows you to just kind of be. Um, so those are some great tools that I've been using recently for, for my meditation practice. And for people like we're just getting into it, Like I'm certainly no expert, but just find your own way with it, you know, learn some different techniques and then figure out what works best for you and allow it to change. I mean, a week ago I was doing 20 minutes of breathing and listening to some stuff. And this morning I did five minutes because that's kind of all I needed today. Like I was ready to go and I didn't have any judgment against that uh, being a quarter of what it had been, you know, just a week ago. So that's my, that's my little to do on meditation. All right. A couple more things. Cause I know we're running late on time here. I'd love for you to share. Again, I mentioned it earlier. You've been out in LA for 20 years. There was a version of Travis, which is still part of you, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, but there was a version of you had some ideas about this is how I'm supposed to do this. This is the way you become an actor and get jobs. And this is how you be in this city, you know, and then over the period of time through your, just your experience of being a human and certainly someone who's been deep in the work and in a, in a long period of awakening, which is amazing. Like what's, what's really shifted for you? Like, how are you doing it differently? I don't know. I'm still waiting for that period where I'm like, Ooh, I'm awake. Um, um, I remember at 25, 25 is that that when I felt like I opened my eyes for the first time in my life, where I became conscious, I felt like that's when my consciousness, I realized. Well, you beat me by fucking 20 years. Oh, no, 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 no. Not saying that I was awakened at that point, but that's when I, because I was, I I, I was almost like awoken to my suffering. Yeah. At 25. 
That's and I, I'm thing. telling you, I started to see I, my relationships were struggling. I started to see my own relationship with myself was struggling. I looked at my family dynamics for the first time. I started like looking at everything like, whoa, this has been here the whole time. And now I had, that's when I began really starting to see the need to untangle all of that. So that's what I mean. No, and I, in, in, for the first time. that's how I received it. Like I'm 50, literally f- probably four and a half years ago is when I had my awakening. Like what the, f- how did I end up here? And I'm not happy. I'm not fulfilled. I did everything I was supposed to do. And this is not it. What the fuck? And so I, that's what I, and so now once you wake up, whatever the version is, like now you can't unsee what you've seen. And so I think that's why I say you're on this, you know, this path of awakening. And I think we always, I don't think there's a period of enlightenment. I think we become maybe more enlightened, but I think once we wake up, now we're really on the journey. Um, and not to, you know, put parameters on it, but I feel like with, at least with my experience, that's what it's been like. And, you know, you're, you're coming up on, you'll be 40 this year, 40 this year, you'll be 40 this yeah. year. So we're talking 15 years ago. So you've been, you know, before that moment in, you know, 15 years ago to today, like what, what has really shifted for you? You know, that's a good question. I think. I've always used the template of an athlete. An athlete is all about dedication, uh, working as hard as you possibly can, creating some kind of regimen to build your skills and your craft, knowing that the game is long-term, thinking in longevity. Um, but hard, hard work and like fierce determination. And so I feel like for me, starting at 25 is when, I feel like I've always had a shovel. I've always had some kind of like pickaxe and I've always been digging and working and digging and working and yearning and going and digging and working. There's been this like angst behind it. And so I think the difference, I would say just in the last like year, year and a half, it's like, oh, hey guy, you've been doing like, you've been building this house for a long time. Don't you, don't you want to live in it? (laughs) And so I think the change now is like my, I, I, I want, I want to live in all the work that I've done and the, like that yearning and like, so it's, it's almost like, I feel like that shovel is, it's still on my tool belt. Uh, the tools are still there, but they're not in my hand at all times. And that feels like the biggest difference I would say in my journey is it's this, it's this less of this, um, like anxious motivation. Cause I feel like my motivation before was to fix or to solve or to heal or to grow. Mm-hmm. And that it almost blinded me in some ways. And I think, I think for me the, where I, at least I feel today is that that process has become less driven by my insecurities. Mm. Um, still, still, they're still there. Still got them. That's right. Still got lots of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's almost like I'm, uh, I, I'm not like um, playing catch up. I feel like a lot of my life before I felt like I was behind. And I was always the underdog and I've got to work harder than I've ever worked. And I've got to, I, I, I can't sleep tonight because I got to figure this thing out. And it just felt like it was always this, I don't know, mad, this mad dash to like figure it out. I'm like, just fucking relax, guy. <laughs> it's like, slow down. Like, what are you trying to solve? Like, you got a whole life. So I think there's a, there's, there's just been an overall, like, let's pull back and take in the view. Dude, that's really rich. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm glad I asked the question because I think that is a common narrative for all of us. There's, there's this striving to achieve, to be accepted, to be loved. There's all these things underneath that, all the insecurities. And we never, some of us never move into that house and we're always building and it's never enough. And we've got to add this on. We've got to tear this down. And we, there's the, like this scarcity mindset that we're not enough. 
And I think what, what you're talking about here is you've stepped into this idea of abundance and like, I'm good. Not that I'm done doing anything, but I'm just good. There's a sense of contentment and that, that life doesn't have to be hard all the yeah, time. Not that I don't, and not that I don't feel like an imposter sometimes and, and, and not that I am not fueled by insecurity sometimes. Like it's still like, of course, but I, but I think the overall, the, the overall, the feeling has become much, much less burdensome. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, I love, that's, that's great. Great wisdom for all of us to just really think about in our lives. Like where are we still just striving for those kind of lower energetic reasons, right? And it's it's okay because we could do some really cool shit when our insecurities are, are driving us. But when that's it, when the only tool in our tool belt is a hammer, everything's a nail. And, and can we have the the option to use different tools? And then can we just put them away because the day the job is done? And I think that's that's really the dance that I think a lot of us are in and, and you seem to be in a kind of a great place with that. And again, you've been very clear. You don't have it figured out exactly, but there's an awareness around all the players or a lot of the players and pieces within this that allow you to know when you're just striving for maybe quote unquote, the wrong reasons and you're not just showing up as, as, Travis, as you, this is who I am. And this is, you know, this is what I'm here to do. Mm -hmm. I love it, brother. And I I think it's, it's clear that I am being very candid, but wanting to make sure. Yeah, I hear you. But but that's, that's my journey in describing myself because I don't want to come off as someone that, that seems like a know it all, like he has everything together when, when, when everyone, everyone goes through their own shit. So I think I'm probably hitting that one a little too hard. So um, on, on the head, but that's, I guess that's my way of just, you know, humanizing myself. And that, cause I know that sometimes you, I hear people come from a place where, where they're like in this state of perfection. And, mm-hmm. um, I guess that there's, there's just this desire for me to, to, you know, really humble myself here. Yeah. And I think you, you've done an, a, like anything you've kind of qualified you haven't needed to just from from my receiving of it but i also understand that you're a public figure and so something you say can be taken out of context you're just like i just don't want to deal with this i'm going to throw the disclaimers in there just so everybody knows that i'm not a dick who thinks he's got it all figured out like i'm just like everybody else like we're on this journey it it, that's been very clear in your your tone today but i also get it you know, so I appreciate that that's important to you, that you're very clear with people on you're still, we're all a little fucked up and we're all trying to figure it out and it's all good. Like we're all, again, we're all in this together. Um, so anyway, I'm going to wrap up here with a couple final questions. I want to know when you're not on, on the set, when you're not preparing when you're not doing your biohacks, what do you, what do you enjoy doing? Like what is, what's alive for you? I go into the ocean with uh, my dog, just swimming in the water with her, watching her jump over waves, um, watching a sunset at the beach, playing paddle tennis, hanging out with friends and watching really great content and talking about it. Um, hanging out with my girlfriend, uh, doing a lot of stuff at the park. Love, love just being out in nature. Um, Reading. What are you reading right now? What's a what's a good book for everyone to to? I don't want to, I don't want to mess up the title. Of the yeah, don't fuck up the title. This one's been great. So I didn't want to mess up the the author. That's Adam Grant, and it's called Think Again, and it's actually a lot about unlearning. That's Let's one go. Of the main themes. Think again. Um, I like it. So it's it's really it's, so far it's been um it's been wonderful. But yeah, I I, I would say just live my life when I'm it's also part of the work too you know just like I feel like one of the lessons I learned as a young actor is you have to go live your life you need those experiences to to round you out as a human being because it all plays into the work and I think for a while there I had my head down and I'm like I just need to learn yeah and it's like no 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 living your life is learning yeah 
That's a huge lesson. I mean, I think we, we do, you know, what's interesting is when, when we go live our life and then we come back and we start learning some of these things, we, they actually give us more context for what our experience is. And sometimes we learn first, but we don't have any experience with it. And then we go do the thing. We're like, Oh, that's what they were talking about. But it's like, and I think either way it works, but you can't just have the learning piece. You've got to get out there and live life. By the way, when you, when you stepped away, I, I teased that I was gonna. I had a book for you to read. Oh, what is it? Oh well, God, one of my is one of my closest friends. He's a lion tracker. He's also done a lot of personal work, does coaching. But his name is Boyd Vardy, and the book is called The Lion Tracker's Guide to Life. Whoa, brother! Great title. It's an amazing book. It's very readable. It's like 110 pages. It's, you'll read it in, in a day. It's awesome. So, and I've, I've spoken about it a few times on the podcast, but it's, it's definitely a must have. Um, it's, a, it's a book I've given out over, probably over 200 times by now. It's that good. Dang. It's that, and it's applicable to everybody. You know, whether you're on the journey, haven't started, whatever, it's going to land somewhere for, for everyone. I mentioned build on before, and I don't want to leave before we talk about the work you've been doing with that organization and the schools that you guys are building. And I believe you're on number eight right now in Senegal. Is that right? Yeah. Fuck. Take us through that a little bit. Like you raise money and then the school doesn't build itself. Like what's it like? You got to get people involved and like, how does, what does the process look like? Built On is an amazing organization. They've been around for 30 years. They've built over, they're almost around like 2,200 schools around the world. They're really all about empowerment, cultural exchange. And their, their main mission is to break the cycles of poverty, literacy, and low expectation mm. through service and education. So what they do is they have after-school programs around some of the cities in the U.S. where they empower the youth of their community to be of service and make changes that they want. So they really get these kids in the unique mindset to take action and to realize they have the power to take action, to create the change that they want in their community. And then they take these same kids to then go build a school in the redeveloping world with a loving community that is ready to make changes for themselves. And so it's this service within a service within a service. It's really profound. That's one component. Another component is like you and your friends could raise the capital to go build a school and, and you would then do whatever kind of fundraising you'd want to do. Each of you would have to raise your certain portion, whether that's like, let's say $3,500 each. You've got 16 people on your team. It's $35,000 to build a school plus 5,000 for an adult literacy program. So the adults in the community can learn to read, right? You then go through the process of raising the money. You pick a build date. Build on has this beautiful structure in place where they take you from door to door in like eight or nine days. You live with a community. You get to um, basically stay in, in the home of a host family that is given to you. They give you a, a name that's, that's from their culture. You learn about all of their different um, uh, cultural t- t- uh, traditions. You learn about their, their music and their art and their agriculture and their commerce. You learn about so many beautiful things about who they are. They ask you questions about yourself. You've got translators pretty much the whole time. And you also build the foundation of the school together. And then when you leave, they as a community, they're the ones that actually finish building the school. And a lot of times it's the first school that they've ever had in their communities. And so the Build On is it's an incredible organization. I've been an, a global ambassador for them since 2014. The impact is unquestionable. And education changes lives. It will change generations of lives. And it can break the cycles of poverty, it can break the cycles of illiteracy, and it can break the cycles of what I think can be the most detrimental, low expectations. So it's, a, it's an amazing organization, buildon.org. Um, I'll be building my eighth school in Senegal, and I'm leading a global campaign right now with eight teams that are, each team is going to build a school in one of Buildon's host countries. There's eight countries. Um, and so right now, it's, it's just the process of bringing awareness to build on. It's the process of once you go on trek, you will, for the, after you go on trek the first time, you will for sure go a second and a third. That's just how this works. You see the impact, you see the experience that you get to have, the connections that you make is, are extraordinary. Um, it's an immersive experience. It's an empowering experience for every party involved. And it's a, it's a truly a just incredible organization. They, the format that they've built is, 
is it's just so effective in creating change. And so look them up, get involved. Uh, if you want to support my cause, you can go to my Instagram. There should be a link if you want to donate to the school I'm building in Senegal. Um, but more importantly, just go check out the organization for yourself. Dude, your entire energy shifted when I asked you about that. When we went from talking about you to talking about Build On, I mean, it's incredible just to see how inspired you are by the work. And it's like, you are an incredible ambassador and spokesman. Like, holy shit, dude. Like I'm in, like I'm getting my buddies <laughs> together to do this. And I know I could just tell like, just the, you know, we have opportunities to, to make donations, right? I mean, that's the line of work you're in, 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 in my experience, in my career, so much of it just is like, ugh, it just feels like writing a check and it's not that fun. But to be able to have this, as you said, immersive experience to learn about the culture, to see the people that are being impacted and being inspired by the opportunities that they haven't been given and just to open those doors. Holy shit. Yeah, Dude, that's you amazing. Forget, you forget how much we take advantage of our educational system here. You, when, as a kid growing up in America or, or other developed countries, you know you're going to school. Like, that's not a question. A lot of these communities, it is a question. And sometimes they don't have access to a school, that, but the closest one might be four or five kilometers. So mm. your kids don't end up having the ability to walk all the way to a school until they're nine or 10 years old. So you're having kids start primary school, first grade, at nine or 10. Mm. And so the development process is just on, de it's delayed. And so having a school within their community, it just, it just changes the possibilities. And I love that. So the, get involved. Go. Yeah. You need to get your hands dirty. Let's go. go. I'm in. <laughs> I'm so in. This is awesome. I'm glad I asked. Do you want to go on my trek? When's your trek? We're going to go, I think on my 40th birthday. So I think we're going October 30th to November 7th. I got a couple spots. Let ponder on that. Uh, if you're if you're interested, I have a couple spots that are open. Um, we'll talk about it. But as long as we as long as we get to celebrate my birthday, because my birthday is the eighth. Oh no shit! <laughs> yeah. And your birthday is what the? F I saw you were early yeah. November. It's like, the, it's like fourth. It's the fourth fifth. It's both. I was born at midnight of the fourth, which is really the fifth. I've always celebrated the fourth. Oh no! I started shit. celebrating the fifth. I was born exactly at midnight. So I, I kind of have two births. Celebrate both. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I'm going to check with my wife, but I'd be so down for that. It's a, it's, it's a, that's a soul experience. It sounds like it just hearing you talk about it. It's like, what, what, why, why wouldn't I, why wouldn't I do that? Yeah. Okay. Two last questions. They're not related to anything we've really talked about, except dude, what's it like? having a relationship, like finding the right partner as someone who's like, you're in Hollywood and like public figure that the, is how much of a challenge is that? Um, I don't know. I don't consider myself a public figure, but I think for me, I, I have always end up finding relationships and really loving relationships with people that I've so, um, just, I guess the way I can describe it is proximity. It's always been around where I live, the park, the grocery store. It's always been a very authentic opening that has happened. That's how a lot of my relationships have taken shape. Mm. And I don't want to knock any of the apps because they're really effective and they've brought together so many people. But for me, that's always been my, my experience. And I, I, I don't know if, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I don't know how that uh, being a, a, in this business has affected my relationships, but I'm sure it's had some kind of impact. I don't know how to articulate it. Sure, that makes that makes sense. That's fair. Okay, I'm sure all the ladies out there are wondering about that. <laughs> I'm curious, um, just because from time to time we talk about investing on the podcast because it's something that I, you know, I was a trader in Chicago for almost 20 years, and then since I've been in Austin, nice. we we've been here about eight years. Yeah. We've been here about eight years and uh, I've just been doing a lot of private equity investing. And so I'm always curious, like people who've, you know, made a, made a little bit of money, like w what do you do with the, you know, the money that comes in? Do you, do you have anything that's really fun and interesting that you enjoy doing? Okay. So if I knew about compound interest, 
at 20, I wish, uh, you know, I would have handled my money very differently. I've learned about what to do with my money a little bit later in the game. And that's a regret that I have that, you know, again, expectation versus reality. It's reality. Can't change it. So since I've learned about um, smart things, the wisest things to do with my money, I have been. So I've, I really have got money in the market that I will never touch again. I'll just let that have grow compound interest forever. Um, uh, my goal is to just continue to keep money in the market because it's, you know, it will annually bring you six to 10%. And over the course of 10 years, the market has never let itself down and it continues to grow, blah, blah, blah. So money in the market is something that I think is really important. Um, I've made some investments in some companies that I believe in, some friends of mine. So that's another avenue that I've, I feel like I've created some strong relationships with some of my investments. I've recently started doing this thing. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know uh, if you know much about um, the DeFi space. Yes. But I've got a little bit of money in that. It's just this, it's basically um, a coin that's called the drip. I've got a drip coin, like a, quite a few drip coins. And it's, I, it's in this platform called Faucet and it's through MetaMask. And I, I don't know how to truly describe it to the greatest lengths in, in a short amount of time, but it's uh, it's a, it's the new platform, which is, I don't know if you have, do you have Faucet or, or Drip? Or I don't, have? I don't have those, but I have plenty of other in the crypto space. So I've been, yeah. I, I was going to ask you if you had, if you've played around in that at all. Yeah, yeah. I definitely played around a little bit and I've got, I definitely have money in Ethereum and, and some, some crypto when it comes to my, just my, my investment portfolio. Yeah. Um, so I'm learning, learning, I'm learning more about money in my late thirties sure. and what to do with it. And it's something that uh, I wish they taught this in high schools. No I shit. They taught a financial literacy class, um, but it's it's taken time for me to really begin to understand the process of it and and how to make wise decisions with my money and my capital and and how to have your money work for you. And and so it's a uh, yeah. I'm still playing that game, and I, I I still think that there's a lot to learn. And and I think building wealth is is really important when when you're starting to think about longevity and the future and all those things. And it's stuff that, again, I did not think about at 20, 25, 30, or 35. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it in my late thirties. Well, at least you know, you're thinking about it. Never. Some people never yeah. get to that point. So I think that's important that it's on your radar and you're playing and you're experiencing different parts of what, you know, building wealth looks like. And you've obviously found something that really resonates with the being in the market. So you're like, okay, that's going to be a linchpin for what I'm doing. And We've got some of these other next things. Is property. Next is property. That's 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 the next element of my yeah my my wealth game. Good. That's wise, yeah. I believe. In just in my experience, yeah. And then one other, I have I kind of shared a few things that I like to use, and people who listen to the podcast know that I'm a huge fan of this product in particular. I am an investor. So I want to be very clear about that, <laughs> but I only invested because I fucking loved the product. It's called, feel, it's called feel free. And it's a, um, combination of Kava and Kratom. And this is different than other products because this actually has the full root and the full leaf that are micro ground. It's not an extract. I've been, you've been using it since December of last year. So a year plus. And let me tell you for pre-workout, it's great. It gives you energy focus. If you've got a creative session to do great. Whenever I do a podcast, I have some feel free. Um, we go out to dinner at night. If we're going out with friends. I'm not a big drinker. It's an incredible alcohol alternative because you just feel open you know, part of the medicine is open, being open hearted. So you just super connected, present. I know I have friends who have younger kids. My kids are 14, 16 and 19. So I'm not really in. I mean, that's just incredible. Number one, that you've got three kids because you're, you're such a young man. I'm 50, but yeah, sure. <laughs> I know. You look like a young man. Well, thank you. I'll take that. But my friends who have younger kids and younger kids are, it's, they're, they're busy. They're sometimes you don't really want to do what your four-year-old wants to do. They'll have some feel free and they just drop in. They'll drop in for two hours without even thinking about it. And so this stuff's amazing. I, I'd be curious, I'm going to send you some, but I'd be curious to know what your experience is just with your craft. You know, if like okay. you're doing an audition 
if you had some, obviously I wouldn't recommend doing it the very first time. If you want you to work with the, 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 uh, the tonic a little bit, but I have friends, I have a buddy of mine who's a big time pastor out in LA who I gave it to him in September and he won't go on stage without it now. Cause it's just that much of a game changer. So there's send me, I'm I'd sending love, you. I'd love to try. Yes. Awesome. Uh, Okay, so we talked about where people can can donate to build on and learn more through your Instagram. Your Instagram is it's it's just Travis Van Winkle. Oh, so simple. Anything else people you want people to know about you, where they can find you, or uh, my Twitter is TV Dub D T V D U B. Uh, I mean, I have TikTok. I'm still kind of getting into it, but yeah, no, you know, if you want to find me, you, you'll probably be able to just. Look for me. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Yep. And I want a special thank you to Natasha for setting this up. I can see why she uh, she put us together, dude. I really I really dig your your vibe, your energy, and I look forward to hosting you here in Austin sometime, and then hopefully being on that trip to Senegal. That'd be super dope. Well, we're gonna stay in touch, and I'm I'm, I'm really happy that she did put me on the show because there is a lot of this is a lane that just is really natural and I appreciate it. It's good to meet you. And when I'm in Austin, I will absolutely come see you and we will hang out because I will be in Austin before too long, just because it's like, I just feel like I want to go back. Yeah. You just got to come back. Um, yeah. And then we'll be in touch about everything. So awesome. just let, let's send it all percolate. I love it. All right, brother. Have an awesome day. Thanks so much for being on today. Yep. Thanks for having me.